If you want to make it big as a fiction writer in China, there are ways to reach that goal that I'm now going to list here. 1. You can alter the themes and morals of your stories until they coincide with the ideology of the ruling party, thus getting you nationwide endorsement as your works can now be integrated to the worldwide propaganda effort. A list should probably have more than one theme. I like that intro. It brings a sense of continuity. Ji Xin Liu has had a career that at first glance seems normal. Then you take a closer look and it feels like one of a kind. Then you go even closer and it becomes one of few. He has been the face of Chinese science fiction since the translation of his magnum opus trilogy, Remembrance of Earth's Past. But let's not talk about those. That's where he reached greatness because he wrote whatever he wanted, especially towards the end of the trilogy. I'm here to concentrate to what he writes when he's told what the message needs to be. Chinese propaganda is something I first thought I'd need to introduce and explain to whoever's watching. That was when I finished the first draft of this script, in early 2019, and forgot it for years. Now I know I don't really need to tell you about the intricacies of how China wants to shape the narratives about itself. You all know about it now. They are terrible at it. Laughably so. Since Covid started spreading from Wuhan and has at the moment infected nearly 400 million people, China hasn't seen a rise in cases since like first few months. If we trust the official records, I guess that would be the big thing that has brought the well-deserved scrutiny upon Chinese media and forced the rest of the world to see those statements as mostly on the other side of reality. The official stance of the government in regards to everything is that China doesn't make mistakes. In anything. No matter what unsuccessful endeavor we'd put under the looking glass. If you make questions about the empty new cities, Uyghur camps, internet censorship, water shortages, or the ethics or long-time effects of one-child policy, the official response would be, we did everything perfectly, stop spreading this anti-Chinese propaganda. Now go home and listen Iron Man tell you how great we are, and how great our dairy products are. So everyone working inside this propaganda machinery are basically holding up a cardboard facade of a city that's burning, because they themselves light it up every day. I'm just going to play that naked gun clip here. Please disperse! Nothing to see here, please! So how has this ideology shaped the works of a writer whose work has now been translated for most of the world, and sold like 10 million copies? Let's go through the stories in the first collection of his short fiction. That would be The Wandering Earth. Liu has written a lot more, but I need to keep this contained to something I can myself easily comprehend. And his best-known novel was translated in a way that would have not been possible in China. So let's stay in the material that was made specifically for Chinese audiences. I'm going through these stories in no particular order. The Sun of China is the third story. It won the China Galaxy Science Fiction Award of the year 2002. Does this mean it's the best novella that Chinese speculative fiction produced that year? I don't know. I couldn't find the rules for this award. Meaning I don't know how many writers can win the first place in one year, but it's a winner alright. Shui is a simple young man with a fistful of dreams as he travels from his tiny home village to the mega cities of China. There he becomes a window cleaner at skyscrapers, a profession commonly referred as Spider-Man. When Shui keeps doing his thing, the Son of China project begins to take place. A massive mirror orbiting Earth on geosynchronous orbit. 
He happens to be a friend of a man whose mirror technology is used in building of this behemoth that can control the weathers of the whole country. You might be asking yourself, wouldn't an undertaking of this magnitude cost like all the money in the world like ten times? To that I say, look over there, those chicks are wearing skirts. <laughs> Amazing. As solar winds begin to dim the giant mirror, it's decided that window cleaners, like Shu, should be sent to live on the mirror, keeping it clean. Sure, why not, is the response of the investors that now don't need to hire engineers and top-tier PhD people to the job. So Shui and many like him move to space. They work on the orbit, become wealthy, and the mirror makes China a better place for everyone. When the rest of the world follows this example, the sun of China eventually becomes redundant. So just to be an inspiration to everyone, they decide to put a crew of volunteers on board and use the sun of China as a solar sail to travel to the stars. The crew will be sleeping cryogenically to last for millennia. Cryogenic sleep is invented in every Jizin story when it serves the plot. Often it's an option for minor inconveniences, like should I wash the dishes or wait 200 years so that the problem might have gone away. This is all well and good, but you are likely now asking, sounds like a fine premise, so what's the story? No, that was the story, but nothing happened. Except a simple man does what he's told, then gets to go to space and everyone is happy. And that's why it won the best science fiction award of the year. For isn't that the best possible moral a story can have? Think of Liu giving a summary of the story to the voters of the Galaxy Award. Man who can barely read, stays dumb, obeys and is rewarded. The result is that China is the best in everything. Sounds like we don't even need to read this story. Great premise, one of the best we've ever heard. Here's your medal. When the world evolves towards utopia, the most common question becomes if the humans can be worth anything. Especially if they aren't trained to be among the elite few that keep the world running. This isn't a problem for utopias only. Utopias, dystopias, any future really, humans serve less purpose. Those who have no education become a mere drag for the society. So turning the window cleaners to be the heroes of the story is an incredibly forced way of giving hope of purpose for the most simple-minded of the population. Should we clean the giant space mirror with robots? Nah, let's, let's send there some cleaners who can hold a mop correctly. Robots aren't invented in this world. And because nothing ever goes wrong in China, training cleaners to be astronauts is cheaper and more sensible than training astronauts to be cleaners. Take that, Ben Affleck, for thinking that Armageddon wasn't thought through. And I'm serious, nothing goes wrong. There is no point where we'd hear something like this. 10,000 acres of wooded residential land were scorched in an instant when a laser cannon aboard the Strategic Defense Peace Platform misfired today during routine startup tests. We see that Liu knew what sort of story he had to write to make it published everywhere. This was long before the three-body problem, so he wasn't a household name yet. Here he has to balance the great technological innovations bringing wealth and prosperity to all, while still maintaining the world where the wealth can be achieved by being a hard worker. Not really something one finds outside of satire. Closest thing I can come up with is when Futurama had a helium mine on the surface of the sun. Does it make any sense? No, but it didn't try to. It needed some excuse to start its plot. Stealing an unlimited supply of birthday-grade helium from the unsuspecting moon. Sun. At night it's called the moon. Shui is made to be our point of view character, but me calling him simple isn't telling the whole story. He's straight from the Stone Age. He basically learns that the Earth is round and orbits the Sun right before he goes to orbit. He will not and should not become the sharpest knife in the Caesar. I think we have now all learned that the meek shall inherit the Earth. Was this a heavy start? I thought so. 
The story was somewhat easy to dissect. That's one reason it makes a fine starting point. This does make it easy to see how Forrest Gump could be re-edited for Chinese audiences. He rises atop of the world by always doing exactly as he's told. That would have sounded like a joke right until that re-edit of Fight Club was created. Though I do want to give credit for how information is presented in this story. Because a simpleton main character requires someone to explain to him what's happening. Usually, every Jizin's character is an astrophysics expert and everyone has a PhD in delivering exposition dumps that begin with, as you know. So let's jump to our next story. For the benefit of mankind. So this is a weird one. Not just on a scale of these few stories, but like on a scale of all the stories. It made me feel that this could only be written by a Chinese author. No, actually it's more like a reverse propaganda tale written by an anti-Chinese writer as a parody of what Chinese would write. Are you following me? I'm not. I'm just going to tell you what happens in this story. Smooth bore is a gun for hire in not too distant future. It's the current century, I presume. Smoothbore is his assassin name, but it always sounds so weird that I'm not going to say it out loud anymore. Instead of Smoothbore, I'm just going to say the first Swedish word I can think of every time. He's hired by a bunch of rich people to kill three insignificant targets. Smurgos finds these poor nobodies and returns to interrogate the oligarchs about why these penniless individuals need to be eliminated. The explanation Surströmming gets is aliens. Or people that left Earth and came back. Or some creator aliens that started life on Earth. It's not really clear. I blame the translation. And it doesn't matter. I'll just say aliens. Aliens that are coming to colonize Earth. They will send humans to Australia and then force upon them the following. They will find the poorest human and observe how much it requires to keep that person alive. Food, clothing, medicine and so forth. When these conquerors have seen these minimum requirements for one person, every single human will be taken care of by getting them this tiny amount that they need to survive. The rich folk that have found out about this plan are redistributing their wealth so that the world would not have a single poor person when the time of planet-wide annexation comes to pass. Targets of Trollhammeren are the few who had decided not to accept the money that the billionaires tried to give them. If they remain poor, the rest of the world will soon become just as poor. Our hero then meets one of these aliens. The alien tells Dolf Lundgren about the planet they are coming from. On their homeworld, the slippery slope of capitalism first brought the problem where the rich could modify their brains to be so much more intelligent th than the poor that they became basically different species. This technology made the poor people useless and generations passed until it escalated to one person owning the entire planet while the remaining two billion owned nothing and had to pay for the air and water. This man was known as the last capitalist. All the remaining population jumped into slow spaceships and eventually came across Earth, where they now want to avoid similar situation. The story ends while Mr. Bork 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 is warming soup by burning money. Just recapping the plot might make it seem like this is a dark comedy. A tale too silly to be taken seriously. If Stanislav Lem was forced to write Soviet propaganda, this is what he might have tried to get published. But this isn't a light-hearted story. As the narrative proceeds, we often flash back to Humpahela Natten's youth, when he wasn't yet a cold-blooded killer. And it gets rough. We are told in a gruesome detail how a gambling addict gets his legs sewn off, and how a small beggar girl slowly dies to a blood poisoning. 
that sets a tone that this isn't a tale to be taken lightly. So yeah, this cautionary tale also won the Best Story Written in China award, three years after the previous one. This contradicts the idea of the Son of China in a way that makes bit more sense. Simple poor people become useless. Then again, same thing happens as a result of prosperity, which usually makes rich people useless too, just as might happen with the concept of money. Money doesn't exist in the 24th century. The acquisition of wealth is no longer the driving force in our lives. We work to better ourselves and the rest of humanity. That's how the universe works in his earlier story. There, an alien explains people how the time when a civilization needs to physically work to support themselves is insignificantly small in the grand scheme of things. And same thing with money. It's only needed for a tiny moment. I'm not saying Liu automatically thinks this Roddenberry-esque future is inevitable, but there is enough optimism in his writing that I can't just ignore it. But now there's one thing that might crush this utopia. Capital is big! Do you think Liu wanted to write about how capitalism destroys us? In this previously mentioned earlier short story collection of his, before he became big, there are multiple stories about the intrinsic value of art. Give this man infinite time and freedom and he might write another ant kind. Wait, that doesn't work. Almost no one has read that. Force Liu to write a screenplay and you'll get a Roland Emmerich movie. Let him write a screenplay and you might get Holy Motors. Oh well, at least we got a sequel for that storyline in Red Alert 3 that we never knew we wanted. I'm escaping to the one place that hasn't been corrupted by capitalism. Space! Sorry, Tim Curry. Space has also been corrupted by capitalism. You need to come back and defeat David Hasselhoff in whatever plotline he's tangled in. Taking care of God. It has some problems. It suffers from being bad, but its greatest sin is the reason it exists at all. Aliens arrive. These ones are of that Arthur C. Clarke variety that started the life on Earth and are the main reason to our existence now. Then they spent some time at light speed so they could return billions of years later. They return as two billion old people, who now want Earth's peoples to take care of them. Because they are now old and useless and we are apparently obligated to keep them happy. Nothing that I just said is metaphorical, this is literally the setting. People of Earth agree. After all, we are now going to get to use the highly advanced technologies that the gods brought with them. I hear that the technology you gave us will soon allow us to experience true communism. Wait, are we going to continue that red alert plot? I am the premier. This is my timeline. No, it's not, Tim Curry. That would be too fun. Instead, the guards manage to be just as useless as the roach people in District 9. They are too demented to teach humans to use any of their technical wonders. Now the two billion old people just turn into a drag that becomes noticeable in the planet's economy. Two billion more mouths to feed that contribute nothing to the workforce. The visitors feel their demands are justified due to a sacrifice they endured long ago. In distant past, the old gods had to take part in a battle that's so huge that a bunch of ships collided and created a black hole. Then there's a lady who's going away at the speed of light and no one will ever catch her. The only thing that matters is that people get fed up and tell the gods to leave. That is what the gods do. After giving a long monologue, about how they shouldn't have forced us to go through this. The end! Think of the dumbest aliens you've come across in any fiction. 
where do the gods rank? Even when aliens can travel across the galaxies, the narrative often needs some excuse for us to be able to defeat them. Sometimes they can be punched, or we can just wait until they get sick. Maybe their planet is radioactive, so you can blow it all up with a single explosion. Or maybe you can just wait until it rains, because water melts them and they arrived naked. To force this story into existence, Liu invented a race that can create intelligent life out of nothing, build a galaxy spanning shield, travel near light speed, and build so much spaceship that driving them to one place will create a star that will turn to a black hole. That's pretty advanced stuff. But then they got bored and forgot everything. Now, why does this story exist? Well, what's the moral of the story? What did we learn? That it's unfair to expect your kids to take care of you during your old age. Or to take it a bit further, it's unfair to have lots of kids just so they could become your caretakers when you are old and useless. Even if you feel you made sacrifices for them. So this story is written by a person who says that the Chinese government did nothing wrong when it comes to the one-child policy. Yeah, this next part will be about that. One-child policy. This might be really heavy. If you don't want to listen, feel free to skip to the next part. I'm no expert in this subject matter, but I do know that outside of mainland China, no one will claim that said policy couldn't have been executed better. I will be referring to Nan Fu Wang's 2019 documentary One Child Nation as my source. When interviewers have pressured Xi Jinping to talk about this subject, the government has always been right. There was only one way to do it, and that's how it was done, obviously. So what could have been done differently? Well, here's one idea. Since you possess this propaganda machinery, maybe use it to tell the people that girls shouldn't automatically marry and leave their families when they reach adulthood, thus not giving boys the advantage of becoming more useful for those families. This might have helped balancing the current gender divide. Families that were only allowed one child preferred boys. Thus, girls were aborted and abandoned. Millions and millions of them. Here's another idea. Maybe tell everyone that those extra kids will be deported and given to adoption abroad. So there's no incentive to make one's families grow, but no one needs to die. Well, they did start doing that. But not the day after the one-child policy started. Not the week after that. But 12 years later. 12 years. That should have taken a day. This is what happens when you're not allowed to question anything. Only thing that the propaganda machine kept telling everyone was that the policy is great, government is bestest, greatest nation, long live our Stotska. All this sounds insane, but what's more insane is what this man started to come across while taking photos of trash. Discarded fetuses, forcefully aborted, nearly fully formed babies, could be found amongst the trash heaps across the countryside labeled as medical waste. This is just the tip of the iceberg when we count the dead babies that were abandoned just because they were girls. We are still talking about the statements of a sci-fi writer who's best known for his ability to create these worlds with huge concepts that may lead to worldwide prosperity. And he thinks this was fine. Now think that you are reading a fictional story. In that story, dead fetuses and babies are seen daily, forgotten on the roadsides. I would mock that writer. This world isn't thought out. This made-up nation is too stupid to exist. 
how could that country move on after this monstrosity comes to an end? It's not like you can, you can forever pretend that this was a fine idea all along. Oh, well that was easy. I'm not going to talk too long about every story. Not all of them contain sinister undertones or feel meaningful to the point of this video. Like this next one, the Micro Era. A lonely astronaut returns to Earth after 17,000 years. The sun has been unstable and the inner planets have burned to a crisp. But on Earth he finds a new human race. They managed to shrink themselves to a fraction of a fraction of their original size. This allowed them to hide inside the Earth's crust and escape the firestorm. As the city of millions could be only a meter in diameter, so it was easy to bury those cities kilometers underground. Plot is just the tiny humans explaining to the last giant how much easier their life is now, as they only need like one trillionth of the natural resources compared to the olden times. And how risk-free their life is now that they can live without the fear of collision. That's all fine. Moral of the story, it's better to consume less. This is all well and good. No need to drag the part of micro-humans defeating the normal humans to becoming an allegory of past and future cold wars. Because you can expand that into a full-length novel later. And then expand the mutually assured destruction part to be a focal point of a whole trilogy a few years after that. Then there's a story called The Devourer. Huge lizard aliens come to Earth to turn humans into cattle and use everything from the planet until only a sad shell remains. But it's not that interesting. There are ancient dinosaurs that seem to think that we should have made Octavia Butler's blood child into our Bible, but it's not too important. When all is settled, everyone still gets a pony. A starved, sickened, pale space pony. With her eyes is a story I genuinely like. Then there's the mountain. I made a rambling one-take synopsis of it years ago. Go listen it if you want to, but I don't want to really analyze it. It's funnier if you just assume it's not really about anything. And the final is called Cannonball. It's about building a planet-piercing elevator like in that Total Recall remake that you forgot you saw, and everything that can go wrong during such enormous undertaking. Also not that important now, but I guess I do have few things to say about the story in the title. So about the wandering earth. Even if you never opened a Zizian book, you might have seen the movie adaptation. It's likely the most Jizin Liu story there is, in that it's about this huge concept, not about the plot. I don't even remember if there were characters with names. The sun starts to become hotter for science reasons, and humanity builds engines so enormous that they can remove the whole planet and start looking for a new home, while spending few millennia underground. There's not really a story here, so for the movie it was decided that the Earth nearly falls to Jupiter while attempting to gather speed with the gravity sling. The resulting chaos is a Roland Emmerich movie, but Chinese. If you want to know more, go to a channel called Accented Cinema. That guy understands Chinese culture more than me. Wandering Earth represents what Chinese sci-fi wants to be today. It's not about China, but rather a tale where the whole humankind comes together for the common good. But I guess I can find a line or two that jumps from this story to fit this video. In light of harsh environmental conditions, by law only one out of the three newly wed married couples was permitted to procreate. The rights were awarded by a lottery... No, 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 I'm not gonna return to that. Ooh, this part I had also forgotten. When the Earth goes through the outer solar system, beyond Jupiter's orbit, a rebellion breaks off. 
Suddenly, people who believe that the sun isn't actually warming want to overthrow the government and return the planet to its original orbit. After some fighting, it is confirmed that the sun really is turning into its red giant face and we really should be going. Our point of view character fights on the government side during the rebellion. When the fighting ends, thousands of rebels are sentenced to death. Here this hero of ours goes for a surprisingly lengthy rant about how those thousands of deaths aren't enough. That those most horrendous human scum should be able to die thousand deaths each. They should be killed until they die to death and then we should murder their faces because they are just the worst. I'm from Buenos Aires and I say kill them all! Yeah! Okay. yeah. I made it this far before using anything from Starship Troopers. I should get a medal. How would that movie be edited for Chinese audiences? Probably just adding this lady to as many scenes as possible. <laughs> well, those rebels did think they were doing the right thing. I had completely forgotten that rebellion part when I revisited this story. It comes so out of nowhere and feels so unnecessary. During 50 pages, mankind changes Earth's orbit to sling it from the solar system using the gravity of Sun and Jupiter. Enough things can go wrong here. There are stakes and drama, as was proven by the movie adaptation. But then there was likely a note from the editor to Liu. Here's a thing you should include. Then we can once again celebrate you as the greatest author in the country. It was the Galaxy Award winner of the year 2000. This book is kind of his greatest hits collection. How would your moral compass guide you if you were not from a surveillance state tech dystopia? Here's a fine summary from a recent Zero Punctuation, where the context is what side you should pick in a narrative of a game. Obviously there's a lengthy debate to be had over what kind of balance of order and personal freedom is necessary for a healthy society to function, but here's my quick summary of the main points. Never side with the fascists, you fucking twats. It's almost never the narratively satisfying path. There's a reason why you rarely see a TV or movie story arc in which the protagonist realises that rigidly following the rules at all times and never questioning authority is really smart and always the best thing to do. This does create a fine snapshot of how China wants to present itself in different contexts. In the movie scene worldwide, whole world should work together and forget their quarrels. In a story meant to be read mainly in China, resistance is futile. Ok, here's the other part I was looking for. Interestingly, every world religion had vanished without a trace overnight. People finally realized that if God truly existed, he was a real bastard. Can you imagine that being written by a non-Chinese? A while back I talked about children of men, and it knew perfectly that a worldwide crisis like this would be interpreted as a punishment from whichever god. No matter if you followed Allah or Elrond, all the sinners should repent for whatever angers their deity this time. God being a bastard isn't an idea that ends religions. It's more like the exact opposite. I assume I'm allowed to criticize this logic, since it doesn't matter what religion I follow, my government doesn't come to tell me I'm wrong. There is still one more story I need to discuss. Curse 5.0 from 2010 is a different kind of tale. I assume it was actually made to be a parody. The translation makes humorous nuances often disappear. But the previous stories were told by Jizin Liu, the engineer who wanted to be a published science fiction writer. This is from 2010, from an acclaimed best-selling author of Remembrance of Earth's Past trilogy. A man with enough clout to write about what he wants, instead of just following guidelines from a vague yet menacing government agency. Curse 5.0 is like a Kurt Vonnegut story. The world ends, but that's just something that happens in the background, and it even has a sort of Kilgore trout in it. 
Curse 5.0 is a computer virus that starts as something harmless and evolves during decades to something that goes full Skynet and destroys humanity in an instant. Part of the virus's evolution is the fault of two homeless writers, Jisin Liu, a failed version of the author himself who wrote the three million body problem that no one bought, and Pan Dai Jiao, which I guess is the Kilgore of the story. The virus stays alive through the decades and keeps evolving thanks to the birth of IT archaeology. It's defined like this. IT archaeology was largely concerned with uncovering various relics that still lived in nooks and crannies of cyberspace, like a 10-year-old web page that had never seen a click of a mouse, or a bulletin board system that hadn't seen a visitor in 20 years but still submitted new posts. Of these virtual artifacts, viruses of antiquity were the most sought after by IT archaeologists. Sounds great! I mean, that's not sci-fi outside of China. Everywhere else that's a thing done by thousands. But in China, I wouldn't dare to try. <laughs> Hometown of the two failed writers comes to be Taiyuan, a city that grows to be the Dubai of the Far East, thanks to its massive coal mining industry. Coal mining. Okay, this is just great. This reminds me of Olaf Stapledon's old future history, Last and First Men, a story that spans billions of years. In it, thousands of years into the future, humans stopped burning coal for energy. Not because of pollution, but because the planet ran out of coal. Last and First Men was written in the 1920s, whole century ago. There was no nature that could suffer or should be protected. At least no one thought about it. And then there's early 21st century China. Every other nation knows we should just build solar panels, dams and geothermal wells, but would China admit that its emissions would have any negative consequences? The country is turning its ship, but early 2000s, this could still be a thing. This Far East Dubai that would definitely stay glistening pure white during its years also has a sex industry that, quote, had answered the government's call and designated every Sunday as a day for sexual aid for vulnerable groups. So migrant workers can get sex for free. I have a guess what might have inspired this. There's a movie about that. So the end result is that the virus destroys all humans. And it's all because hackers are terrible people and AI is scary and everything was fine until the government stopped being in charge of everything. Sounds simple. But every weird part in this story is something that can be overlooked because it just hangs in the background, not really affecting the story. For long, I kept asking myself, is this a parody? How can I know? Well, there's a quote Liu gave during an award ceremony in New York that tells if he really feels that China can maintain its growth with coal mining. I remember finishing 2001 a Space Odyssey and walking outside to gaze into the night sky, I was able to see the galaxy thanks to the unpolluted sky of China back then. And just for the lulls, the city of Taiyuan becomes almost completely self-functioning. Everything is automated. Cars, toasters, etc. So when your toenail clippings end to a trash bin, your doctors get a message if you have a calcium deficiency, for example. Or you will be informed if your body becomes dangerously full of alcohol. So you are never alone, all the time, everyone knows what you're doing. And that has no negative consequences whatsoever. At least before the virus, when all this is government controlled. This story deserves a slow clap. 
a successful experiment in the amount of ironic insanity one can successfully sneak through the censors does revive my hope for humankind, at least a little bit. Quick tangent is needed here. So I returned to writing this because I thought I found the guy that's Chizin's friend in this curse story. I didn't. Completely wrong person. But I need to tell you about him anyway. Chen Qifan is a different Chinese sci-fi writer. His works have also been translated to all major languages worldwide, even Finnish. Besides me, about five people and one reindeer live here, so if it can be read in Finnish, it's everywhere. I got interested when it was described as a Chinese cyberpunk story, in a dystopian world ravaged by environmental disasters. How could that be? The name of the genre contains the word punk. Because these stories involve worlds where big tech is owned by the elite and most need to fight just to not dwell in poverty. Can you have that? China doesn't make mistakes and can't be evil, right? Well, in this near future, China was doing great. So great that every other country basically got jealous and started cheating. Rest of the world ruined everything and created the dystopian wasteland. Fine. This was expected. But the strangest part of the novel comes in a form of a cybernetic girl taking control of a surveillance system of a major city. We are told what she sees, what literally everything means. Every single citizen is followed constantly. Not just where they go and what they do, but every feeling they have is monitored and analyzed. Describing this system keeps on going. And going. If I say that even every bird that's ever crossed the city had a camera attached to them, that might not be exaggerating. If George Orwell was made to read this, he'd tell Quifan to calm down, because this is turning just beyond insane. Most of these millions of constantly watched people are depressed, sad, hate themselves, hate the computer screens that they keep staring daily, want something more. What creates all this misery? Well, one thing that it isn't is the all-absorbing surveillance state. What? Do you think that had some negative consequences? Have you learned nothing? Of course, this teardown of privacy is never presented as a bad thing. You knew that, because this novel got published. You know what is presented as somewhat unnatural? Consumption of free porn. Even when your government sees everyone's browser history, the ways people get their kicks are, well, different from ours. Here's Kelsey Grammer presenting the overall feel. You want to bet on a dude fucking an alligator? Money plane. It's actually crazier. But that's in the same ballpark. And there is no money plane. I think I'm done now. I've talked about every relevant story and now I'm getting distracted by other authors. I might have skipped about half of this collection, but it's still a fine microcosm of Jizin's career. Here we've seen stories from the 90s to 2010s, from an unknown to a bestseller. As we come closer to current date, we see a man who has learned to navigate through the jungle of restrictions, instead of remaining as a tool that has to end every story with and then China was the greatest. When he does write whatever he wants, it's just the best thing. I guess I'm saying that we should keep reading Jizin stuff. For it is the best way to unleash the potential of not just Jizin, but everyone who wants to be like him. If you don't want to support this, well, download illegal torrents or something. Current state of exported Chinese fiction is easy to explain, but the situation is still pretty unique. During China's Cultural Revolution, the genre of science fiction was, quote, banned under suspicion of spiritual pollution in a general backlash against westernization. China's big, in culture and area. 
You can't just walk to the neighboring country or another state to find a less conservative publisher, like you and I could if your book is rejected. So of course all fiction will be heavily edited after these writers manage to crawl themselves out of that hole. Edited in a way that will leave a western reader baffled. When I consumed loads of older western sci-fi and especially Philip K. Dick's work, a following rather pessimistic viewpoint was often taken. The Cold War will a. never end or b will end the civilization as we know it. In those situations, the protagonists of these stories might have acknowledged that they may not be fighting for the right cause, but they knew what side they were on. Everyone knew what the sides were. There was you and the other. Pretty self-explanatory. But then there's China. It doesn't have that clear opponent. Not on the outside. China does have an enemy on the inside. I think it's quite clear when the government wants every story's message to be that the government is never wrong, even if it changes its mind about something. If everyone should learn to stand in line, the enemy is individuality. Identifying as an independent person with wants and opinions is the greatest threat if the goal is that everyone should just identify as Chinese. That's a slippery slope to people demanding something resembling a democracy. That would be terrible, right? This is what Liu said in a 2019 interview. If China were to transform into a democracy, it would be hell on earth, he said. I would evacuate tomorrow to the United States or Europe or I don't know. The irony of the countries he was proposing were democracies seemed to escape his notice. Well, as was said by a man eating space lizard, let us not speak of morals. In the universe such considerations are meaningless. Now you know what your main theme has to be if you want to become a successful fiction writer in China. Xi Jin Liu knows to keep quiet when he knows he will be returning to his home country with over half a billion security cameras. There's a beautiful irony in the fact that this don't ask, don't tell policy forces China to spend roughly 10 billion dollars yearly in its messaging. That sum can only go up, but the system is built in a way where it isn't allowed to learn when it's exporting a joke. If the one non-changing message of this pointlessly complicated machine is if I say I'm right, it means that I'm right, it turns a flaw that could be fixed into a feature. That machine can never learn to detect sarcasm. <laughs>